Welcome back to Chapter 3 with Physics 125 at GRCC. In this video, we are going to talk about vector addition. So I'll go through the slides and talk us through an example. But there is also going to be a video showing this process in action with me at the light board going through a full example the way that I would in class. In this particular lecture video, there's also one example problem that has its own separate video. Uh, but really what we're doing here is still building up the foundational skills we need to get to the core piece of chapter three, which is projectile motion. We kind of skip over it here so that we can save it for its own separate lecture video. All right, so as a reminder of what our key takeaways from the previous lecture video um, for chapter three were. We are going to have to be thinking a little bit about trigonometry. We've started to see sine and cosine. In this particular video, we're going to be talking about tangent and more specifically inverse tangent or arctangent. And the reason why all of these come up is because we want to be able to add multiple vectors together to know where the sum or total or resultant vector points. In this picture here, we show um, two different vectors, f1 and f2. And if we put them head to tail with each other, they show us where the resultant vector points. But functionally, we see that we have to break these down into horizontal and vertical components. We've been thinking about vector components already, and we're going to see why that matters so much in our full example that we're about to lead into. All right, here we go. So one of the core problem types in chapter three is a vector addition problem that looks pretty much like this. Here are two vectors. How do we add them together? Keeping in mind all of the ideas of vectors, because one thing I need us to understand extremely, extremely well is that this six mile vector that points 10 degrees south of west and this four mile vector that points 25 degrees east of north, we cannot add those together and get 10. That's not how any of this works. And if we do something like that in our heads or think that it's reasonable, we've kind of missed the entire point of vectors, which is one of the single most important aspects of our course because vectors are part of all of the different physics quantities we're going to be learning about all semester. We need to recognize the importance of this skill. It is not too difficult to build as a skill, but we do need to recognize that we've got to put the work in and be willing to ask questions and ask for help, help come to office hours if we need to, in order to feel comfortable with it. Okay, so when we are asked to find the size and direction of the total vector, the question that we're being asked is, let's say that these were two trips taken by the same person. They started at some location, they walked one of these trips, and then immediately walked the second one. Where are they now compared to their starting point? The very first thing to do when you see a vector at an angle is to break it up into components. I'm going to repeat that because in an on-campus course, all throughout the semester, I ask every time to my students, what do we do when we see a vector at an angle? And I wait until at least half the group says we break it up into components. It is extremely important that that is kind of a call and response happening in your brain when you see these vectors. So so that we can write it in all capital letters and highlight it in our notebook. When we see a vector at an angle, we break it up into components right away. It's the first thing we do before we even decide what we're being asked to solve for. We break that vector into components if it's at an angle. So to do that, we break it up into pieces that point up and down and pieces that point side to side where those pieces are trying to tell us about the original vector. So for example, this four mile vector, that purple arrow that's the four mile vector points more up than it does down. So it's got an up piece and it points more to the right than it does to the left. So it has a piece that points to the right. 
these components are kind of like taking the long way of a journey and they have to start at the same start and end at the same end. The arrows are extremely important to get correct. For the six mile um, vector, the one that is a little bit longer, it points more to the left on our page than it does to the right, so it has a piece that points to the left. And it points more down the page than it does to the up, than it does up, and so it points down the page. None of these steps so far are meant to be tricky, but we need to recognize why we are doing them, otherwise it's very easy to make mistakes if we're just trying to mimic something we don't quite understand. These components are giving us the long way to go this same overall displacement. Okay, so the reason why this matters is because now we can use our sine and cosine pieces to get actual number values for these horizontal and vertical components. What is really important here to remember, and I'm going to go back one step, is that right now before we drew any arrows, the 10 degrees and 25 degrees, it should be very clear to us where that angle is located. A lot of times students make the drawing and break them into um, components, and then all of a sudden they can't decide where that angle goes because it's kind of floating in the middle of the triangle that you made. But we need to recognize there wasn't a triangle to begin with. That 10 degrees is between the hypotenuse and the horizontal piece of the six mile um, vector. And that 25 degrees is between the hypotenuse and the vertical component of that vector. So we apply sine to the opposite sides and cosine to the adjacent sides. Because we currently have arrows drawn on the page, we aren't worrying about adding plus and minus signs because they're sitting next to the arrows that are telling us the direction. But we do need to recognize that up and down would have different directions from each other, left and right would have different directions or different signs from each other. Okay, the reason we take these components is just like we did at the very end of the previous lecture video, we're going to put these head to tail. Now the key thing is that any order is absolutely fine for these. I've taken the same set of um, four arrows and just copy pasted them on our slide twice. What we see is that no matter which way that we order them, we are going to get the same sum vector, total vector, resultant vector, that points from the start of all of these different arrows to the end of all of these different arrows. It is an identical vector no matter what order you put those components in, as long as you do them head to tail. The key now is that if we look at this and we see that we have gone 3.63 up and 1.04 down, we need to um, subtract one from the other. And if we see that we've gone 5.91 to the left and 1.69 to the right, we have to subtract those from each other as well. And so we get number values for how much we are now further north of where we were and how much we are further west of where we were. Those can then be used in the Pythagorean theorem. The 4.22 and 2.59 are the smaller sides. And so the hypotenuse or the total is found using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So the total squared is equal to 4.22 squared plus 2.9 squared, which means that that total squared is 24.5. We take the square root of both sides, and we're now a little bit under five miles away from where we started. Now, by definition, the tangent of the angle as we've drawn it in the smaller angle is the opposite side over the adjacent side. So the tangent would be 0.614 if we put that into our calculators. And theta by itself then, if we want the angle, we have to use the inverse tangent button or tangent minus one on button on our calculator to figure out the angle, which is going to be 31.5 degrees for the smaller angle or 50 8.5 degrees for the bigger angle, if you drew it in the bottom right corner from where we are. 
we'll see that over and over is that as long as you've labeled an angle in your triangle and solved for it, there are two possible labels or angles you could have labeled and solved for, and they'll always add up together to 90 degrees. Okay. A lot of this is things that I would have done on the board if we were in class, which is why there is that supplemental video showing step by step from blank slate to finished problem, how this works. And I go through a couple more steps that we, um, that we didn't really put on these slides, but functionally there are three primary steps that we took. We broke each of our given vectors into its components. If you flip back, hopefully in your notes, you have all capital letters and highlighted. When we see a vector at an angle, we break it up into components. That's always, always going to be important for us. The second step that we did um, here and that you'll see in that additional video is that we add the components together. We used entirely a picture here, but we also are going to show how to do this with a table of just listing all the X stuff and listing all the Y stuff separately. That's in that supplemental video that I'm talking about. And to get the final answer, we had to use the Pythagorean theorem to get the length. And we had to use the inverse tangent function of our calculator to get the angle. It isn't actually meaningful or useful to see this done with just two different vectors over and over and over again, because the steps are identical and there are no other sticking points. But that's why there's this video and a supplemental one to go through and watch as often as you need to and listen for the steps that we take. The number values themselves aren't the important part. The process is the important part. We can also do more examples with you in office hours and just start from scratch and go through so that you can ask questions as it's happening. We're definitely willing to do that, Professor Seablack and I, and we want to be able to help you understand this skill. Now, if we look at how the resultant vector compares to the initial vectors, we see that the head to tail method from the textbook does actually work, but we also hopefully recognize that there is no possible way to draw this, no matter how careful we are, and actually get three digits of precision on our answer if we're just using the graphical method. It's a possibly useful check for us to make sure it makes sense, but it is not the actual quantitative method that we're going to be working through. Okay, there's two other topics to touch on before we move on to our big goals of chapter three. The first is simply recognizing that when we think about the idea of vector subtraction, that's not really possible, but what we can do is create a new vector that is the opposite or negative of a vector. So if we're trying to find vector A subtracted um, ve vector B, what we really are doing is vector addition with all of the same processes of breaking things into components, head to tail method, all of that, but using the idea of negative B instead. So from this point forward, except for a couple of chapters, the reason why this skill is so important, just vectors in general, is because every vector we're going to see in every chapter we talk about is often at an angle. So when we see a vector at an angle, we have to break it up into components. And so we need to make sure we understand how those components interact with each other and how these different vectors interact with each other. Let's do a quick check of our understanding. If I tell you that vector A points north and that vector B points west, what I want you to do is to pause the video and draw out what direction, what compass direction, the sum vector A plus B and the difference vector, a minus b, where those would point. So go ahead and pause the video to do that on your own. All right, so if we have vector a pointing north, and we have vector b pointing west, then if we wanted a plus b, so that was one of the things we asked about, we would take a first, head to tail method, we would add b, and then really important, we always go from the very start, 
to the very end with our sum vector or resultant vector. And so A plus B would point to the northwest. So northwest. If instead we are asking about A minus B, we still take A, but now we realize that what that means is we need A plus the idea of negative B. So if B points to the west, then negative B functionally points to the right. And so we add the idea of negative B, and again we go from the very start to the very end, and we get that A minus B as a difference vector points to the northeast. One thing to consider is that B minus A would be a completely separate um, direction as well. And we can solve for that too. And B minus A is not the same thing as A minus B. So I'll let you try that one on your own and you can always email me to check your answer. Okay, it's been long enough in this lecture video that it's starting to feel like there's a lot of math in this chapter and not a lot of physics. I want to bring us back to the reason why this has been so important to us. We've been talking in general about vectors to lay the foundational knowledge that we'll need to build off of, and we have used displacement as an example, but I want us to recognize that the reason why all of this matters is because we've already learned about a whole lot of different physics quantities that are vectors. And when we are thinking about them in two dimensions, it now matters quite a bit where these different arrows point. So let's, let's go with a couple of examples. One we'll do in this lecture video and one will have its own separate example video. Let's say that we take a trip that is 60 miles north, so we're driving for two hours and we've gone 60 miles north, then we turn and we go 80 miles east for two hours. The questions about quantities that are not vectors are hopefully pretty straightforward to answer. The total distance traveled would just be 60 miles plus 80 miles. That would give us 140 total miles. And the average speed is taking the distance traveled over the elapsed time. A lot of students fall into the trap of trying to find T final and T initial and lose track of the common sense understanding that we all have about how time works. If we've been driving for two hours and we drive for another two hours, we have been in the car for four total hours. So the average speed would take 140 miles divided by four hours, and we would get an average speed of 35 miles per hour. So clearly we're not on highways, but our average speed is 35 miles per hour. Both of those didn't care at all about the ideas of north and east. So let's think instead now about the vector questions that we can ask about. We want to know what the displacement vector is, and then we need to figure out the average velocity. Now, the displacement vector, we've been thinking about this whole lecture video as being the thing that goes from the start to the end, but now we have a direct application that we need to give it to. If we finish this triangle by drawing an arrow from the very start to the very end, the length of that arrow, we use the Pythagorean theorem, 60 miles squared plus 80 miles squared is equal to that length squared. When we take the square root of both sides, we get 100 miles. For the angle, we have to specify what angle we are looking at, and then we use the inverse tangent idea. We look at the opposite side divided by the adjacent side and use that inverse tangent button on our calculator, and we will get an angle of 53 degrees. 53 degrees east of north, but as long as we've drawn in a picture, then we're all set. And the average velocity here, by definition, is the displacement divided by the elapsed time. So it's the 100 miles of length 
divided by four hours, that gives us 25 miles per hour, and the direction for velocity is going to be the same as the direction for the displacement, and so it's also 53 degrees east of north. Now again, when we uh, go through example questions in the slides, I can't be as interactive as I would have liked, which is why we have a follow-up example that is very similar, but also slightly harder. And we will go through all of those same questions, distance, speed, displacement, and velocity for that example in a separate example problem where we can see it happening interactively start to finish. So we'll be looking for that example 3A video um, after this lecture video. The last thing I want to mention briefly before we finish this lecture video is a concept that we do not go into detail on. It's from section 3.5 in the book, which is thinking about relative velocity and the idea of addition of velocities. There are several important real world applications that mean we want to talk about it. We're just not going to do a lot of actual problem solving with this particular section of the book. If we are thinking about a headwind or a tailwind, if you've ever heard that term, or a crosswind, pilots have to be able to understand how that's going to affect the motion of their plane. Because there are several different vectors at work here. The velocity you would be able to go if there was no wind, the velocity of the wind itself, and then your actual velocity relative to the ground. To see this a little bit better, we're going to talk about a boat on a river. So we have a boat that in calm water, if the water is not moving, it would be able to travel at a speed of 8 meters per second. But we happen to be in a river that has a current, a constant current of 2 meters per second to the east. There really are four different questions that we could ask and answer, and in previous semesters that had more weeks in the semester, we actually did talk about this, but it's one of the pieces that kind of got cut out as we um, focused on other topics in our curriculum. Let's start with the two fairly straightforward ones. We either drive our boat um, downstream or with the current, or we drive our boat upstream against the current. I'm not going to go through all of the math on these because it isn't a, um, a topic that we spend a lot of time on, but I do want us to recognize that we've got some intuition for this. If we are imagining swimming or boating with the current, we will go faster than we would have in calm water. What that means is our 8 meters per second that we can go with the boat and the 2 meters per second kind of add together and we end up going at a rate of 10 meters per second relative to the stationary ground on the shore. For the second question, if we're going against the current, then we think we're able to go 8 meters per second, but the river is fighting us 2 meters per second, and our boat is physically going 6 meters per second relative to the um, stationary ground on the shore. So if we found the time for each of these, and you're welcome to try it on your own, we would find a much shorter time when we're going downstream and a longer time when we're going upstream. Okay. The other two directions we could kind of think about is let's say that we just try to drive the boat straight across the river to see a friend who's standing on the other side, and we've kind of forgotten that there's a current. It will carry our boat down the river, and we can use the idea of addition of velocities to figure out how far down the river we've gone. Again, I'm not going to go through the full math problem here because it's not something that we're going to see in assignments or tests, but I want us to be aware of it. And then if we do recognize that there's a current and we want to account for it, we want to drive into the um, current so that it, when it eventually does um, bring us downstream, we'll hit our actual goal, that is going to mean that we are functionally moving at a different rate than the 8 meters per second we think relative to the um, stationary ground. Now the reason why we mention this topic at all beyond the real world applications, which are always useful, 
is because we are going to see additional velocities when we are building some of the tools that we'll see in several chapters from now. You don't have to follow any of this or fully understand it, but it's kind of previewing when this is going to show back up again. And when it does show up in chapter six, we're basically gonna remind ourselves from scratch what it means to add or subtract velocities, including this idea of A plus negative B that we've also introduced in this lecture video. So what you're gonna see after this is a further example of vector addition, a full example problem, thinking about average velocity when we aren't moving in one dimension, and then we will move on to the projectile motion lecture video and all of the different example problems that come with it. So I will see you in those next videos.